Hello, I'm Pastor Ken Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, and I invite you to our Bible study. We're here for you on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, and you can watch it anytime after that on YouTube. I also invite you and the people you love to join us in worship on Sunday morning in person at 8.30 or 10.30. And you can watch online at those same times, or you can watch it later on on YouTube by searching for trinitydelray.org. Okay, that's my invitation to you. Now, I want to begin our Bible study under a brand new question today, and that question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? One of the great mysteries revealed in the Bible is this person named Jesus. Who is Jesus? For many believers, Jesus is the Christ. They call him Savior. They call him Lord. But you know, many people stumble over this mystery, perhaps because his words and his deeds are utterly unique. At the same time, the Bible shows Jesus is thoroughly human. The mystery that we intend to study together, therefore, is who is Jesus? How do the scriptures reveal and how do the scriptures prove his identity to us? Pastor, is, is that your music? Um, it's very distracting. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I want to ask you the question. I'll take care of that. And thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. Who are you is my question. Uh, in order to get us started. Mm -hmm. um, that's a facsimile, a uh, pretend driver's license. Please don't try to use that one. It won't work anywhere. Uh, but I want to ask you, how do you prove your identity? You tell me your name. I say, well, I doubt that. You tell me about yourself. I said, I, I don't believe any of that. So how do you prove your identity? What documents do you have? Oh, your birth certificate. Yeah. Birth certificate. What else might you have? Marriage. Oh, marriage certificate. Marriage certificate. Family. Uh -huh. did, did someone mention passport? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Driver's license. Okay. Anything? Military card. Oh, yeah, military card. Some Social people. security number. Uh, we used to present our social security cards. Now they tell them to keep them our, at home so Hidden. that someone doesn't steal it. Medicare card. Medicare card. That might be acceptable in some cases. How about a Costco card? A Costco card. <laughs> or... I, I actually had to use Costco card in my work card one time when I was traveling way before, you know, 911 um, because I had put my driver's license in something else and didn't take that along. So they actually let me get on the plane with my Costco card and I've my work of that. My work ID. <laughs> but they work work IDs or school IDs many times have your picture on it also. Right. Yep. And most of these can be traced back to the original document that says on a certain day you were born in that city. Yep. All right. So I wonder if how do you get a driver's license with a star in the upper right corner. Oh, oh, they have new, me on that one. new regulations. You have to have like a birth certificate or a passport. And then generally you have to also prove um, your current address that you're living at that address by, uh, by proving like maybe your car registration or a bill or something of that sort that has the, your name and address on it, I believe. Because I just went through that um, and updated my uh, driver's license here within the last couple of weeks. Okay, so all of them get traced back to those original documents, and now right. your your driver's license will be a uh, a type of affidavit that said we know that this person has presented that evidence. Okay, uh, they were not. They were saying that we can't have you flying anymore without that star. But I was told a couple of weeks ago 
that they've delayed that uh, for uh, another year. Yes, because of the difficulty with COVID of getting everybody in and getting them right. changed over. Right, okay. So we, we know how to prove your identity. So that's an uh, easy question. So how about Jesus? Suppose someone asked you, sitting down over coffee, who is Jesus? How would you answer? He's the son of God. How do you know? How do you know? What is the evidence that you would present to your friend about your Jesus? Uh, there's uh, of course the Bible. The Bible. Uh, Joseph, Joseph, who's the historian, has written history that uh, also um, verifies things in the Bible uh, of Jesus' birth and what he was and who he was. Well, many people saw Jesus in his day. The question is, would you be more sure if you were one of them? And how had the believers become so sure that Jesus was the promised Messiah? I apologize, the music is still louder than I intended. But I wanted to coat these questions as, as very serious questions to you, because you and I are on earth as witnesses to Jesus. And many people, many, many people, I'd say the great majority of Christians have trouble witnessing to their faith in Jesus. They don't know how to start. And when someone challenges them, they get all flustered. Well, I want to do something with you in the next few weeks to present some really clear evidence that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in, in him, you will have life in his name, and you want the people you love to have that same life. Uh, but how do you know? And you were presenting some of the evidence. Um, the primary evidence to Jesus is the Bible, right? Right, correct. Okay, and there are historians who have spoken of him in real time, that is in the time when he was alive, like Josephus you mentioned, and also not only the apostles, but the early church uh, leaders who knew people who knew him. I know that's once removed, but it's still evidence for the histor historicity. There's, uh, go there's ahead. Art oh, go ahead. I was gonna say there's also artifacts if you go to Jerusalem or go to Israel that you can actually follow and trace. Yeah. Yes, you can verify that the geographical <laughs> details are uh, correct. The people who saw Jesus in person wrote down what they saw and heard. So though you and I cannot go back and use a time machine to see Jesus in person, uh, the question is, would you be any more sure of your faith in Jesus if you had lived when he was alive and saw him and heard him. What do you think? I don't think so. Why or why not is the question. Well, because, I mean, the apostles had been with him for, you know, years. Three, nine, and they three, really three. didn't get it until, I think, after the resurrection. So I'm not sure that I would be any wiser than the apostles as far as... Wiser. <laughs> Well, evidence uh, is fleeting and memories mm -hmm. are short. We have a couple of guarantees. Yep. You know what guarantees? I've mentioned it before in this class that they had those witnesses. And one was when Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance all he had told them. So I joke around a little bit and I said, they didn't have to take notes. I have no evidence that anybody took notes from the Bible. But their identity, Jesus' identity, was fixed in their minds. After the resurrection and the ascension, then came the Feast of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit was given and poured out, and Peter gave his famous uh, first sermon, and everything was changed. The gift of the Holy Spirit 
was that assurance that what they had remembered was also true and it was God's witness to himself. Now, the fourth question, how had the believers become so sure? What was the Holy Spirit. The, Holy Spirit? the Holy Spirit. That's right, Joanne. What else would you add to question? The resurrection. The resurrection. Well, that they saw him after the resurrection. No one had done that before. I, I didn't hear Linda's first comment. Did she say the, the scars? They saw the scars, the actual scars from his being on the cross. Thomas did. They had evidence. They had physical evidence. Yeah. Uh, now Thomas wanted a little bit more firsthand evidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I use the word hand intentionally. He wanted to see, feel, and touch. Correct. And he did. And he did. Yeah. Yeah. So they had evidence and they wrote it down for us. They didn't know us. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That the things that they wrote down become permanent. Permanent. Yeah. So this is a way to answer the question, who is Jesus? Let's go start digging up the evidence. Now, suppose we had, um, you know, like a police lineup, Suppose we lined up all these men and we don't know their names. We just lined them up. That's the best picture I could find. You can take the halos off if you want. But someone draws them with halos because they're saints. Well, I'm a saint also. I'm not sainted, but I'm saint. I'm not going to discuss that this morning, but if you could pick out in the lineup, could you pick out Jesus and say which one was Jesus? Not really. No. Which one? No. Which one? Can you can you pick them out? Is it the one down there in front there? They're holding things. Um, I no. don't. Well, how could you tell if you said this one is Jesus or that one is Jesus? How can you tell? The answer is none of these. None the of artist, them. No, no, that's a trick question. The <laughs> artist drew the 12 apostles. apostles. I was just counting them and there was only 12 there. So Jesus yeah. isn't there. Well, I'll remember Judas. That's unless somebody else wasn't. <laughs> unless Judas had the departed by then. I don't know if Matthias is in there or not. I'm just showing you that when he was with his apostles and they were walking down the road, going somewhere, doing something, you couldn't tell which one was Jesus, except he was the one out in front, and they followed him. But otherwise, you know, when he was walking and talking and with them, if he wasn't doing a miracle or teaching, how could you tell which one was Jesus? He didn't wear a halo. He didn't wear special sandals outfitted uh, just uh, for the Son of God only. There's nothing unique there unless he was doing or saying something that proved he was the Messiah. You couldn't tell. All right. Who is Jesus? Well, consider Jesus in his time. How could he possibly prove his identity to anyone? Does he have any of those documents we talked about? Well, I, I was right. going to say, if, if anybody knew anything about the Old Testament or went back to the Old Testament, they would... They uh, knew a lot of prophecy was revealed, and it was now coming um, to life by Jesus um, by Jesus coming into the world. Very good. Okay, that's one. He How else did Jesus he, prove his identity? He proved he he did miracles. He healed the sick. All right, and that that's what we're going to be looking at. You're way ahead of us. <laughs> How could he prove his identity? Well, those are the two major things. He steps up to someone and he says, I am the son of God. I am the Christ. You know, he does not do that. And it wouldn't work, would it? There were false messiahs in his day and there will be false messiahs, he told us, in every age. So just stating... He could say, my name is Jesus. When you meet a stranger and they say, my name is Bob, 
Well, you probably take their word for it. You do not say, could I see your driver's license? Right? If someone tells you the, a name, if someone gives you the wrong name intentionally, you'll go on believing that until you know differently. So he couldn't prove his identity simply by stating it. But my supposition here is that Jesus says things to those who demanded to know, and he does things. So we're, we're, we're going to concentrate on Jesus' word, what he says. That would be his teaching, wouldn't it? Okay. And his works, as you said, his miracles. All right. So this will fix his identity in the minds and hearts of the people who are his witnesses. And also the ones who reject him, they will know why they didn't believe. So I want to set the scene. We're going to go to John uh, chapter 10. And um, because Bible page flipping using Zoom becomes very cumbersome, I am not asking you to look these passages up in your Bibles. You are welcome to do that. In fact, I encourage you to have a Bible open in case you have something that we don't have on the screen that's going to be useful for us. But um, I have, since we started Zoom, uh, decided to put all the Bible passages in front of us. And there's another reason. The people who watch this at a later time, it's going to go through at a more rapid pace than they would be able to get to that passage in their Bibles. So it's a matter of convenience and helpfulness. Okay, I'm going to set the scene from John chapter 10. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Was well, it things we don't know, most of us, when we read that verse? What's the Feast of Dedication? Anybody? Isn't that when they bring the children? In, I, I'm thinking it's like our confirmation time in life. No? No. It no. says the Feast of Dedication commemorated the cleansing of the temple under Judas Maccabeus in 165 BC after any, uh, yeah, lots of hard Antiochus names. Epiphanes. <laughs> had defiled it by sacrificing a pig on the altar of burnt offering. Yeah. The, the feast was celebrated toward the end of December. This is also the present day Feast of Lights called ha Hanukkah. Joanne, you get the star. Did you read that out of the bottom of your Bible? I certainly did. Uh, <laughs> well, really, uh, you've done the work that uh, I put up there uh, well. from a similar source. So it was not one of the three major feasts that were commanded by God in the Old Testament. This was one that came about 200 years before Jesus was born, 165 years before Jesus was born, but it was 200 years approximately at this time. Now it was winter. Um, can I ask a question here? Always. Uh, thank you. So, you know, it's quoted in the Maccabees and it's only last year, the year before, I got into that, that, that the Maccabees is not in the Bible that That's we right. have, but it's in the Catholic Bible. And also, it is the reason the Jewish people have Hanukkah. So it was also surprising to me, because it celebrates this particular thing. Yes, it's something that has been added to celebrate what took place on yeah. uh, about that time. Now, if you want a brief mention of the apocryphal books, there are 14 of them. They are not in the Protestant Bibles. They are in the Catholic Bibles. You can get a copy of them. In some cases, in First and Second Maccabees, they are helpful history to cover some of the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. 
there's a big gap there historically in the Bible. God had decided not to write anything down about these. But the historians, the Maccabees, <laughs> decided to write down what happened because it was a, a victory for the Jewish people to retake the temple. Now, I want to concentrate on the fact that it was winter. Mm -hmm. And that explains why Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Let's get a picture of that. This is at the south wall of the temple. Now, no one took a picture then. And since then, this has all been destroyed, you know. So based on the measurements and some wild guesses, people have built uh, models and drawn pictures. So you have the south wall here. And on top of the south wall, Solomon had built himself a colonnade. Now, a colonnade is, is we, we see them on impressive buildings. There's all these columns, and then there's the interior. And mm -hmm. I'm just explaining why they were in there, because it was winter. Uh, when, when we used to sing as children, the snow lay on the ground, the sun shone bright, uh, the moon has shone bright uh, when Jesus uh, Christ was born on Christmas night. And you remember singing that? Well, nope. I'm not going to sing it to you, but I thought it's snow on the ground. It's, it's in the Middle East. It, it's hot over there. And it was a long time before I learned that they have the same climate as some of our mid-south mid states. You get some snow. Mm -hmm. Not Minnesota snow, generally. <laughs> Uh, but they, that's why they were walking in the colonnade. Now, you didn't need all that. But when you read this passage, you want to know, well, why were they there? And what, what time was it? Okay. Hmm. So the Jews are celebrating. And then comes the identity question, which is aimed at Jesus. Who are you? They didn't ask that. They said, if you are the Christ... Tell us plainly. They are often gathering around him, uh, challenging Jesus. How long will you keep us in suspense? That's a curious word, that word suspense. It means uh, take away or to make doubt. Uh, so they're accusing, uh, really, they're accusing Jesus of causing their doubt. But the problem, you and I know, is not in them is in them, not in Jesus. All right. Any questions on this? The basic identity question, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Don't use uh, figurative words, in other words. Okay? Okay. Now, <clears throat> earlier from John chapter 5, we had this encounter. I'd like someone to read those six verses. Oh, I'll start it off, Pastor. Uh, John 5, verses 31 to 35. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. All right. Now, there's a rule of law, and it existed at that time. It really still exists today. When you bear witness about yourself, it, is, it does not have a, a final meaning. You can sign in an affidavit that this is true, but it still doesn't establish the truth. It is only establishing your witness to yourself. All right. So when Jesus says that, it is true that his testimony about himself would not be true if he alone, if he alone were bearing witness. So there is another that bears witness about him. And Jesus says, I know his testimony is true. He's talking about John the Baptist, who has now been decapitated. You sent to John, and he means John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. 
all right? And he has borne witness to the truth. Do you remember when uh, John's disciples go and visit Jesus? Do you remember what they asked Jesus? I'll tell you. Are you the one that should come or should we look for another? <laughs> now, uh, no. people who study the Bible debate whether John had doubts or he was using this occasion to send his, he was in prison, okay? Uh, he, using these, uh, this occasion to send his disciples over and be Jesus' disciples. I can't prove either one. It, it's difficult to believe that John doubted after all the evidence that he had been given. He was there at the baptism, which we might talk about later. But John already has a lot of witness to, to bear. Remember, he's Jesus' cousin. And the two mothers, Mary and, uh, whoop, lost her name. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you. Um, they knew something about these two births. And they knew about the witness of the angels. Uh, they had a lot of information which they had experienced. So John had the opportunity to bear witness to the truth that Jesus was the one that was sent. But then Jesus says, not that the testimony I receive is from man, not from man, but I say these things and look at Jesus' heart. He wants these unbelieving Jews to believe and be saved. You see, Jesus never gives up on people. Now, John, he's referring to, was a burning and shining lamp. He, he has been put out when Jesus has said this. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. John came baptizing by, in the River Jordan, saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And many people rushed out to be baptized of him. Of some, he said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He knew that there were some people coming out just to see the spectacle. Well, we have to go click it so it works again. Who is Jesus? That's, our, that's the only question we have for the next few weeks. So then Jesus answers their question. Their question is, tell us plainly. So uh, Jesus says to them in answer, the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Now that is a powerful testimony that Jesus is giving concerning the things that will prove that he is who he says he is. And it's this word works. It doesn't look like a very important word, does it? Works. What are the works of Jesus? What does that mean? The miracles. The miracles? Primarily the miracles. But there are some other things that Jesus does or that happened to him, where he is a passive receptor, okay, but primarily the miracles and the signs that he does, they bear witness about him, that the Father has sent him. Now, the minor point is that John the Baptist witnessed to Jesus, but the major point, number one, is that the works prove Jesus' identity. Another major point is the Father sent me. Now, the unbelievers were not too happy with that designation. He had no evidence to present to prove that the Father had sent him, unless they had been at his baptism, but they weren't. They were not there. 
or they would have seen what John the Baptist witnessed and what two of the apostles wrote down, two of the evangelists wrote down. Okay. I have to be careful because, you know, Mark and Luke are not apostles. All right. The works, underline that. And then uh, I would like a volunteer to read uh, John 5, 37 to 40. I'll do it. John 5, 37 to 40. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. This, his form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one who he has sent. Your search, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's a lot in this passage. I'm not going to exhaust it. I want to underline some things that I put here in bold face uh, print. When I do that, I'm adding my emphasis for our eyes and our hearts to see in particular. Uh, the Bible, of course, doesn't have bold face print here. So the Father bears witness about Jesus. It's true that they had not heard his voice. And of course, they had not seen his form because no one can see the Father. Philip says, show us the Father. And Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Oh. Well, to these people who do not believe in him, he says, you do not have God's word abiding in you. For, and this is the evidence, you don't believe the one whom he sent. Now, you search the scriptures in the Greek as an imperative uh, form, and you could translate this, therefore, search the scriptures. You think in them you have eternal life. He was referring to doing all the works of the law. To the Pharisees, this was the, the primary thing about their religion. You do what God has said in the Old Testament. Of course, they weren't doing that great of a job of that either. But search the scriptures. You think in those you have eternal life. And you can put a but here instead of and, because the word can be translated that way. It is they that bear witness about me. Now, what scriptures is he talking about here? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No. No, the Old Testament. No. The Old Testament. Where's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? They haven't been written yet. Yeah, That's no. right. <laughs> They're in the pro in progress. Well, yeah. Well, we don't know. <laughs> we don't have dates. No. But they don't have they don't have the New Testament. It is being, as you're saying, it's it's happening. It's a live event, and yet you refuse to come to me. If you, and and the implication, of course, is if you came to me, you would have life and life eternal. So we have the witness of the Father and we have the witness of the Old Testament scriptures. Another reader from John uh, chapter 10. The unbeliever said, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Wow. Wow is right. There's a lot in there. Yeah, powerful. Again, the emphasis on the works of Jesus. 
but you don't believe because you're not part of my flock. Mm -hmm. Only believers are in the flock. And believers are called sheep. This is the Good Shepherd chapter, John chapter 10. And here's a very wonderful thing for our hearts. That we are his sheep and we hear Jesus' voice. And that means we hear it as one coming from our Savior. He's not just a person in history who happened to be there. The second thing is Jesus knows us. Instantly pops into my mind, I am Jesus' little lamb. Ever glad at heart I am. For my shepherd gently leads me, knows my needs and well provides me. Loves me every day the same, even. Oh, he knows my name. He even calls me by my He's name. By right. And they follow me. Well, that's a rich word there. Maybe we'll study that another time. We follow him. And as a result of our faith in Jesus, oh no. As a result of what he has done, he gives us eternal life. And our faith receives that gift. And we will never perish. And no one is ever going to snatch them out of Jesus' hands. <laughs> Isn't that a precious promise? Yeah. Give that away to people. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And then this tremendous, tremendous, the importance of the statement, I can't overestimate. Uh -oh. I and the Father are one. How many gods have you? Three? No, one. Three persons, a mystery we don't understand. But there is a unity. I and the Father are one, or one essence. And Jesus is God in the flesh. I, I didn't exhaust the passage, but let's, let's move on. To answer the question, who is Jesus? To sum up what we've done so far, we have his words, we have his works, and we have, as you have said, prophecies that bear witness to him, like pointers, and we have the Father's voice, which we have recorded, not on tape, but in the Gospels at Jesus' baptism. And the dove came down. There's witness. And the Father's voice at the Transfiguration. Remember that when Peter, James, and John went up with Jesus on a high mountain and Jesus was transfigured before them? And they saw Moses and Elijah and talking with them. And there's good old Peter wants to build booze and stay there. No, Peter, we must go down from the mountain. We have work to do. So they heard the father's voice who said, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You see that voice of approval from the father to the son publicly? And Peter and James and John are the only witnesses other than Moses and Elijah. Okay. And we have John the Baptist's testimony. So these are beginning to add up, aren't they? And there should be never any doubt in our hearts, in our minds, to answer the question, who is Jesus? When you came to, to this class this morning, <clears throat> whenever you came to this class, you probably had this all sewn up. I really don't need a lot of help. I know, Pastor, I, I know who Jesus is. You know, it's interesting, Pastor, when you said the Father's voice, um, I think sometimes, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong in making this assumption, but even in today's world, when we have people who have had um, afterlife experiences or, you know, they said they have died and come back, 
Um, I'm thinking of my mother who actually told me, she said, she heard a voice along with a white light that told her it was not time to come. She had to go back and take care of her young son who was only five years old when she was, you know, critically very ill from a bleeding ulcer. And so, you know, we still hear the father's voice today. I mean, those miracles do happen yet for his voice. I, I can't tell you from scripture uh, whose yeah. voice it is. Yeah, whose voice it is, but it, it was very real, she said. So yeah. I don't know better. She, she was a believer, so that's why another reason why. I don't doubt that at all. So um, who is, who, go ahead. Uh, so I'm in another class and we're, we were studying angels, which I never thought I would it, be interested in, but this has been fantastic. And it says when you're there, an angel is by your side to help you pass over. Right. And it might have been the angel's voice. Yes, uh, the scriptures tell us that the angels are the ones who come and carry our souls. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to see where we are in the in the flow of things, because we have nearly uh, we're somewhere around the 40 minute mark. We started we started late, and I want to see whether or not we want to go into an, another section. His words, his works. Okay. See, I print this out uh, beforehand, and then uh, well, we'll just see. Because I put a pause in here uh, so that you might collect your thoughts and ask any questions that you have. Anybody? Um, I do, if you didn't mind, because I'm also in another class studying John. And, uh, and, um, and then I heard the other day that Matthew, uh, we're talking the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. So I've read them, but they don't stay in my head. You know, I know some of the stuff. But, but now they, I'm trying. So when you said, as, as I, uh, Mark and Luke were not apostles, and then uh, the other day someone said Matthew's um, gospel was written for the Jews, and, and, and John's was, I don't know, you have to tell me, but, you know, so it's all quite interesting. Uh, and these are revelations, not revelations. These are documentations of Jesus' miracles. I think all of them. That's all, that's all correct. Um, the reason that Matthew is called written for the Jews is that he makes reference to the Old Testament and uses terms that probably at that time anyway, only they would understand. Mark is a, a Gentile writing to Gentiles, uh, or he may be a Jew who knows how to write to Gentiles. He is Peter's translator. Uh, Mark is not an eyewitness, but he takes what he writes from Peter. It is supposed. Now, there's nothing in the Gospels that says what I just said. This is the record of those who lived in the next generation who knew them personally, the apostles, okay? The early uh, church fathers, they are sometimes called. That's a long story we can't get into here. But what I'm saying is that uh, you can tell from the way Mark is written that he explains some Jewish terms to the Gentiles. Hmm. John is an evangelistic uh, work that is designed to do two things, to bring people to faith in Jesus and to tell the people who do believe that they are, uh, I uh, muted you, Bobby, because uh, there were some noises coming in. Um, you can't help it, it's not your fault. That uh, Mark explains some things. John is, I was saying, writing to be, uh, let believers know that they do have the, the correct story and that their faith is true. And also he writes in order to bring people to faith in Jesus. Now, John puts those purposes down in his gospel in chapter 20 and again in chapter 21. So that's how we know John. Uh, then that leaves Luke. 
Luke was not an eyewitness, but what Luke does, I'm gonna, <laughs> what Luke does is he does some research. He does some research, and you can read that in the first four verses of Luke chapter one, and in the first verse or two of Acts chapter one. Okay, so that's that's more than uh, maybe you wanted to know. But thank you, Chris, for the question as to where these gospels came from. It's a long story. It's a long story. Any other general questions? Because uh, I see that that if we if I do one more click, we're going to get a big uh, a big passage, which we wouldn't have time to um, work mm -hmm. on in detail. So um, let's do this. And uh, and reach you this way. You have any more questions in general about who is Jesus or what we have talked about today, Pastor? Can I just ask? I, I'm sorry, I'm using my cell phone, so it's whenever I touch it, I my sound might sound funny. Oh, I understand. Um, you know, I I really should read more of what Paul Meyer wrote. Um, I I thought he's just an excellent historian um, that. Uh, of our generation um, that uh, my dad, I, I think, even knows. and um, But uh, he used a lot of Josephus, I think, too. Is that right? Josephus. Jo Josephus. Josephus, who uh, gathered a lot of this wonderful things. I, I just love the historical uh, aspects of uh, what M Paul wrote and uh, or with Josephus, because uh, he was able to tie in uh, historical accounts of Jesus being alive. Mm -hmm. right. Right. You know, we were asking about, you know, his identity and we, we can look at other, I mean, it, yes, the Bible is our main source of information uh, that we should use, but there are other sources out there that, and yeah. we've talked about the books uh, that the Catholics uh, have too. But Okay, thank you. Just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, Josephus is what the attorneys would call um, a witness which is who is contrary. I don't have the right legal term, but what that means is if if someone who is not one of Jesus' apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, tells something about Jesus, he's a person you would expect to be speaking against it. And when he verifies the fact that there was this person, Jesus, who was crucified, and his people say he was resurrected. Now, Josephus doesn't say Jesus was re resurrected because he's not a witness to that. Now, what, uh, what Paul Meyer uh, did is to take a very difficult thing to read, that is the original Josephus, and uh, in effect, retranslate it and paraphrase it and add to it historical verities, truths that he can glean from other historical sources. He was at Western Michigan, Western Michigan University, um, just the premier uh, historian. Um, mm -hmm. Students crowded into his class. It was always oversubscribed and um, not everyone who wanted to get his class was able to take it. But we were benefits, uh, we were uh, benefactors of that because of, of his writings. Uh, you can also find a few of his lectures on YouTube. So you go on YouTube and put Paul Meyer and go and enjoy one of his lectures on, on uh, what we're talking about, about Josephus. And some people um, went on some of the trips that he was the uh, primary guide also. I know mm -hmm. I have a friend that went on two of his trips and said they were absolutely marvelous. Yeah. He was walking history book as they went along. Yes. Yeah. He, he knew it uh, better than anyone. Yeah. Anybody and else speaking? And we were fortunate at Trinity Lutheran to have him a couple different times because Marsha Miller had a uh, close relationship with him also and it invited him. Yeah. So. Well, what I'm gonna do for the benefit of those people who don't wanna listen really long, 
I'm going to say I'm glad that you joined us on YouTube and uh, whenever else you are able to watch and study with us. We're going to continue with this question, who is Jesus? Oh, God, be gracious to us and bless us and help us to see Jesus with the eyes of faith through the eyes and ears of those who witnessed him and let us follow him in obedience and faith all the days of our life. We ask it in his name.